Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV, the show that explores the relationship between humans and animals in one of the most beautiful places on earth, Hawaii. Here's what's coming up in the next half hour. We'll witness how a surfing pig made a wish come true for a little girl who traveled all the way from Idaho to Hawaii, but the long journey was worth it. And so being able to go back to this moment in this beach and remember the time that we were here is gonna be what she needs to keep going to battle. Then find out if the boxer is the right dog for your family and it's all about the breed. Plus, we'll follow an equine behaviorist specialist as he helps rescue an abandoned colt. It's all ahead on Pets in Paradise TV. The Hawaiian Islands are the most geographically isolated landmass in the world. People travel thousands of miles to view the rugged coastlines, relax on the beautiful beaches, swim in the crystal clear waters, and enjoy the year-round sunny weather. But that wasn't what drew two-year-old Eloise and her family. I mean, she could have went to Disneyland, Disney World, Nazca, you know, wherever, but she chose to come here. So we're really honored and, uh, you know, we're honored. We loaded up all six kids and we had to fly on two different planes to get here. Six kids on a small confined airplane. I'll let you guess what that was like. We rented two Jeeps so we could drive around because we won't all fit in one car. And today was kind of the big day for us and for Eloise because this whole trip was about getting Eloise over to surf with Kama the surfing pig. And this is just the, the perfect way to end our week. Can you make a pig noise? Mama loves to do things for the kids. So when Eloise contacted us on Facebook and wanted her uh, one and only wish was to meet Kama the Surfing Pig and watch him surf, we had to do all we could to help make it happen. So Eloise has acute lymphoblastic leukemia. ALL for short. It is one of the most curable forms of child, childhood pediatric cancer. A 95% success rate, 95% uh, incident-free treatment. She is currently in the last phase of treatment. We are scheduled to finish treatment on August 13th, 2017. Uh, so there's a 95% chance that she'll just go straight through all the treatment and everything will go great and she won't ever have a relapse. When surfing the net, Eloise came across a surfing pig. She just wants to watch it over and over again. Kama the pig could always put a smile on her face. And if she's sick from chemo, she asks to watch Kama. And if she's having a rough day, she wants to watch Kama. If she's trying to get out of bedtime, she asks to watch Kama. And finally, the moment she's been waiting for. After 4,000 miles, two plane rides, many chemo treatments, and lots of tears, Eloise and her family is meeting the pig that has brought joy to them all. for her to watch Kama for the last year and a half and finally today get to meet him in person and pet him and feed him grapes and just spend the afternoon hanging out with the pig who got her through the worst things of her life. Oh, Eloise loves pigs. She, anytime she sees something that's got a pig on it, we have to buy it for her. She has piles of pig stuffed animals. Uh, we had to buy her a pig pineapple at the Dole Plantation. Yeah, and after the surf session, we caught one all the way in, and what did Ellie have waiting for Kama? Kama's favorite treat, grapes. Nice and sandy ones. Kama loves grapes. Eloise enjoyed a carefree day crawling and playing on the beach with Kama, the kind of childhood memory that her parents would give anything for her to have. We just decided that we couldn't tell her no, and we whipped out the credit card because with one income and six children and leukemia, you just can't afford a week-long trip to Hawaii at the last minute. We're looking at probably over $10,000.
just to get Ellie out to swim and surf with Kama. But for us, it was worth it um, just to see the smile on her faces and to know that um, this is just probably the happiest she's been in the last year and a half, and that's, that's why we did it. She has just had the time of her life today, and I truly don't think there's anything that we'll be able to do in the future that will top what today has meant for her. Her favorite thing in the world is pigs, so she really wanted to meet Kama the Surfing Pig, and we really wanted to meet her. She's such a special baby. And Kama is such a special pig. His courage to do what most animals cannot and his carefree ability to ride the waves of life has served as an inspiration to many. And Eloise's parents are convinced that laughter and aloha are the best medicine. We check Eloise's blood counts all the time because that gives us a really good view into her body and into what the leukemia is doing to her. And it's been fantastic to see that every time we've gone in recently, her blood counts are getting higher and higher and higher. And that means her body is, is battling this. And the only thing that's changed is the anticipation of meeting Kama. So now that we've been here and we've experienced Hawaii and we've experienced Kama and the generosity and the aloha spirit here, this is just gonna carry over through the rest of her treatment and just really give her that last final push to stay strong through all of the stuff she has coming up. Um, she has one more surgery to have her port removed. And then we have a lot of unknowns. You know, if she spikes a fever, we end up in the hospital. She might end up with more blood or platelet transfusions. And so being able to go back to this moment in this beach and remember the time that we were here is gonna be what she needs to keep going to battle and, and really fight through the last of this leukemia. This is getting to see the smile on Ellie's face today. Uh, just getting to watch her as she got to watch the pig and feed the pig some grapes. It, this has just been the, the perfect end of this vacation. It, it's been amazing. <laughs> Because of their ever so stylish haircuts, poodles are easily recognizable. But how did these hairstyles develop? Why the pom-poms on their tails and the bows on their heads? So why do poodles get the extreme hairstyles they've become associated with? The reason is not just for style, but for practicality. Poodles are water retrievers, and in the early 1600s, European breeders realized they could swim better if they didn't have so much heavy wet fur on their bodies. So they were shorn to keep them afloat easier. Some areas though, like on the chest, head, and ankles, tufts of fur were left to keep their joints warm. Top knots were used to keep the hair out of their eyes while swimming. Bows were added so that owners could identify their dogs during competitions. The fancy poodle cuts today are no longer out of necessity, but are simply a tradition that has continued through the years. And now let's learn about another breed, the Boxer. If you get the chance to hang out with a litter of Boxer puppies, you're gonna fall in love. These little guys are about the cutest puppies you can imagine, and you know you want one. They romp, they play, they sometimes look happy, sometimes concerned, sometimes they just look puzzled. The good news is that with some love and proper training, these little guys will grow up to be great pets. According to the American Kennel Club, in 2015, boxers were the 10th most popular breed, up from eight the year before. They came from Germany originally, bred as working dogs back in the 1800s, then later spread across Europe and eventually to the United States after World War I. Their ancestors were from what is now an extinct breed that may have been crossed with a Mastiff, a Bulldog, possibly a Great Dane, and maybe even a Terrier. They were working dogs used as bull baiting dogs and were the first breed to be used as police dogs. Boxers are fairly large, most about a foot nine to two feet tall, with males weighing from 65 to 80 pounds and females 50 to 65. They have a lifespan of 10 to 12 years. Boxers have a distinctly square-shaped head and a blunt muzzle. Their ears fold over naturally, but traditionally have been cropped to stand erect until that practice went out of favor. Their coats are short and they shed moderately. Most are a deep fawn color, some are brindle, and a few are even white. In the personality department, they're intelligent, high energy dogs who like to be in company of their owners and stay busy. 
They're good watchdogs and are alert to strangers. When outside, though, they should always be on a leash because they have a history of chasing other dogs and cats. As for health issues, boxers are prone to certain types of cancer, including brain tumors, and white boxers are prone to skin cancer. Heart conditions are also common, as is hip dysplasia. One thing to keep in mind about boxers, they are susceptible to heat stroke more than other breeds. They need to be kept cool. They're good with children, although maybe a little too rambunctious for toddlers. And they get along fine with other pets in the house, except other dogs of the same sex. Because they were bred as working dogs, boxers are strong-minded and need to be handled in an upbeat, persuasive manner. If you try to force them to do something they don't want to do, they might just sit down and refuse to budge, even more so if you try to jerk them around. To recap, the boxer's good traits include being friendly, playful, energetic, and good with children, and generally with other pets. They require little grooming and aren't prone to too many serious physical problems. Unfortunate traits, boxers have a fairly short lifespan and are known for snorting, wheezing, snoring, drooling, and yes, flatulence. And now you know all about the boxer. As you can see, boxers have big tongues. But some dogs, no matter what the breed, often leave their tongues hanging out all the time. Do you know what that's called? When a dog leaves his tongue out all the time, it's called hanging tongue syndrome. It's usually not a serious problem, and vets are not sure why it happens. But sometimes their tongues get dry and cracked and prone to infections. Another condition is called macroglossia, or big tongue. It could occur in any breed and is a much bigger health threat. When a horse is in trouble, Bettina Parker and her team at Equine 808 get the call. Okay guys, um, we just got a phone call a little while ago regarding a colt. Um, a, the foster parent of this colt called. I'm not sure exactly of all the details. The team gathers up to go down in Ready, person guys? to Ready, really see what's going on. We're heading out to go pick up a colt. I'm just gonna gather up some gear that we'll need and um, pack up the truck and we'll head out. Hi, this is Bettina. Hi, I just want to let you know that we are on our way with the uh, trailer and my team. Okay, are you at home? Okay, we should be there shortly. Now on site, the team immediately gets to work. Hi, Bettina. Hi, hi, nice to meet you. Um, where's the colt at? He's right here in the end stall okay. looking at you. All right, let's go take a look and see what we got. He had some issues when he came to us. He was malnourished and um, his face was off. What we just learned about Hank was that he um, was born out in pasture and his mother had died probably when he was about a month old. Um, because he didn't have the protection of his mother out there in pasture, he probably was trying to nurse off of other mares. Uh, maybe there were some other geldings out there that didn't like him much and he got kicked in the eye. Um, and they found him with his face uh, real swollen and it seems like he may be permanently blind in that eye. Hank's injury is severe, but Equine 808 can help. So I think we're gonna go ahead and take him into our program and uh, see what we can do for Hank. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna try to transport Hank to our ranch. Um, but first thing I need to do is kind of assess Hank's behavior. I'm not so much concerned with his eye, just the natural um, behaviors of a horse. So what I like to do is I like to get myself in the same environment as the horse and see how he reacts to my presence. Christopher Mizio is what's called an equine behavior specialist. Hank being a colt, he's going to be really curious, um, wanting to be with herd. Uh, his natural herd instinct will want him to gather with me. This is all good behavior, normal for a horse. Being a colt, he's going to be naturally friendly, kind of want to bite, nip, maybe kick, treat me like a horse. Christopher looks at Hank's social strengths and weaknesses. Being neglected at a young age can have a strong impact on horses, but Hank is very friendly. Looks like Hank's good with his... Good with his back feet. That's just playfulness there. He just wants to play a little bit. What makes Hank dangerous is probably this eye. The fact that he can't see me right here, he's trusting his ears. 
So if I go behind him where he can't see, he's trying to track me with his good eye, and I touch him there, he's gonna startle. If I go to this side, he can track me with that eye, and it's not as dangerous. See, he doesn't flinch. Christopher will use a combination of touch exercises and positive reinforcement to help Hank. With a horse that can't see, you gotta be really fluid with your movements. Uh, like I was showing you, when I touch his butt, if, if he doesn't know it's coming on his blind side, he'll startle. The team now needs to take Hank to their headquarters to begin the training. First, Hank needs to be haltered, something he's never gone through. All I'm trying to do is let him be calm here while I'm holding him, teaching him that everything that we do here isn't dangerous. His first instinct is going to be to fly and get away because he's too young to fight. So there, Hank's haltered. This is uh, his first haltering experience, so uh, pretty well. Went pretty well. So we're ready to trailer him, I think. Um, what I need you to do is go ahead and pull the trailer forward so we make a fluid motion right into the trailer. Okay, Bettina, what I'd like you to do is open that gate, and it's important that we just continue to walk forward in that trailer, never looking back at him, um, so that he has a solid lead horse to follow. So like I said, I never want to look back at him, giving him any reassurance of what he's spooked about. I'm going to continue just to walk and know that he's going to follow. Christopher's strong lead helps Hank's first transition go smoothly. So that went about as good as it could. Uh, it's important that I go in here with him to show that this is a safe place. I know that he already trusts me because of how we are uh, interacting in the, in the stall. Now Hank is off to his new home at Equine 808. There, the team will care for him and his injury, work to improve his coordination, and train him to be safe around people so he can be successfully adopted out. The whole process could take up to two and a half years. So I think the story checks out because it's natural for him if his mom did die when he was quite young to look for another source of milk. And if he went to a mare or even a stallion that wasn't his, he'd, uh, they'd naturally kick out. There's lots of excitement as Hank arrives at Equine 808, and already there's some curious onlookers. So the plan is, we're gonna, when we get him, we're gonna put this horse, who is about a year old, in with him. So he'll have a little buddy. This horse is never backed out of a trailer. He's a little unsure. I'm gonna give him a little helpful hand here. And that was the first time he's ever backed out of a trailer. While the team will teach Hank many of his new skills, just being around other horses will help too. These guys were eager to check out the new guy. As you can see, he's a new guy, so the other horses want to see what he's all about. Go ahead and shut the gate. When I let him go, he'll probably turn, kick, and run off that direction. Or where he wants to be is with these other horses. Aw, oh, look at him go. <laughs> with no problem meeting new horses, Hank meets his pasture mate. This is Flash. He's about a year and a half old. So far, a good introduction. They'll get more and more interested in each other. Well, now that you can see um, Hank back here at our place, he's actually got a little friend now. Before, he was in a little probably 12 by 12 stall, didn't have any um, other horse contact around, didn't even know that he's a horse. Now he's got a, a playmate. He's got all this room to run. Um, I think Hank is really going to settle down really nice in here. He's going to have some nice training, a lot of people that's going to be interacting with him. And um, he already looks happier to me. Um, and I think, uh, you know, his re rehabilitation process is going to be just awesome. So this is what we do here. We actually re rehabilitate these horses and uh, eventually Hank will be a good horse for somebody one day. From a rough beginning, struggling on his own, Hank still has a long way to go, but the future is looking bright. Welcome to Pets in Paradise TV, the show that explores the relationship between humans and animals in one of the most beautiful places on Earth, Hawaii. 
Here's what's coming up in the next half hour. Obesity is a big problem, and it's estimated that Americans alone spend over $60 billion annually on ways to lose weight. But being overweight is also a problem with man's best friend. We'll find out how Lockie managed to lose some pounds. We'll check out a real shaggy dog in It's All About the Breed. Then, when the sun goes down, some people are just getting started at work. We'll find out what life is like overnight at an animal hospital. It's all just ahead. I'm Allie. I'm Mike. And we help dogs lose weight. This is Lonnie, and she has had Lucky from a puppy, about four years old now. And her husband passed away and left her with what was a little puppy who grew into this mammoth pit bull. Lockie is a Great Dane Bull, which is a mix between an American Pit Bull Terrier and a Great Dane. A healthy weight for this breed is in the 80 pound range, but he's pushed the scales to about 120 pounds. It's very difficult for me to walk him because he's pulling me all over the place and one time walk with him and then he pull me and I couldn't hold him because he's big. We are working to bring him back down into the 80s and the weight loss boot camp, our five day intensive exercise and weight program is aimed to bring him back into his 80 pound happy range where he can be a healthy fit dog again. When Ellie took him to the boot camp, I was so excited, I was so nervous. I said, this is the first time that he he's going to part from me, I've never been you know, away from me for four years. So I was kind of worried at that time, worried, excited. So when she sent me this picture, he was swimming at, in the ocean and he looked so happy. Obesity rates in pets are increasing nationwide. Studies show that more than 54% of dogs are obese, which leads to other health problems, such as arthritis, diabetes, cancer, and ultimately impacts their lifespan. Today is day one for Lockie's weight loss boot camp, and today he weighs in at 119 and a half pounds. Yeah, our work is really cut out with Lockie. Our policy is to just try to keep the dog moving all the time and have fun and sell it to the dog as a fun activity. We just do activities all day long with him. One of our favorite places to take the dogs is the sandbar. It's a great place. We can let them off the leash, even if we don't know them that well, because they're in a confined area. There's really nowhere they can go to. It's a very low impact, high resistance, where the dogs are walking, generally chest deep water. We do jogging, walking. We throw toys between us. So it's a really massive workout. Our plan for Lucky is to uh, bring his weight from 120 pounds down into the 80 range. Uh, he is fed and cooked food, which is not appropriate for a dog, like grilled cheese sandwiches. But when he returns home, he returns to his old habits. He used to go to the kitchen and smell. And then wait, and then wait until I give him. Otherwise, he just sit there and just stay there. <laughs> yeah, he loves food, yeah. Just like weight loss for humans, 90% is what you eat, and Lockie is definitely breaking his diet. And so we want to make sure that we are teaching Lonnie the appropriate foods to feed him and uh, get the weight off of him in a slow and, and a safe manner so that he can maintain the weight loss. Before, I feed him like three scoops a day, but Ellie said now one scoop is enough or half a scoop because he looks must be hungry or something, but he's not hungry, he's just, <laughs> he just loves to eat, so 
I try to make him, you know, an ideal weight so it's much more healthier and much more fun to and easy for me to walk to when it's no, not too big. Yeah. Good boy. <laughs> We also like the, the hike because the hike is, takes them to a different environment that's more natural for them and it's, it's shady and it's cool and polluted water so they can cool off in the water. It's really unstable ground so they're always trying to have to use these muscles to stabilize themselves. It also helps their minds for troubleshooting to figure out how they're getting up and down off rocks and around roots and, and various situations they wouldn't normally face. In the hikes that we are going to, leptospirosis is a problem and we want the dogs to be able to drink the water and enjoy it. So it is important to make sure your dogs are up to date with, with their shots. Lucky is totally up to date with his, so he's ready to go. And we also like the beach. The beach is a great place for exercising your dog. It's the, the water playing in the waves, being knocked over by the waves and having to recover from that. They're using, again, different muscle groups that they're probably not using just laying around the house and eating uh, grilled cheese sandwiches. And walking in the sand provides more resistance than walking on a hard surface. So it's a great workout that helps develop different tendons, ligaments, and muscles. Part of our regimen with Lucky is uh, weekly walks. We go twice a week and we take him for hour long walks each time. And on days that we get there, quite often he is extremely lethargic and has to be coaxed on his feet so that he'll get walking. Um, and once he's going, he's fine, but that's just because he's generally a couch potato in his own environment. I notice he's a lot better now that he's lost seven pounds. When I pick him up, he's a little more ready to go. Yeah, definitely. Lockheed loves the feeling of being more weightless in the water. Swimming is another great aerobic activity that's low impact and high resistance. So this is day five and Lockheed is complete with his boot camp and we have gone from 119 and a half pound to 113 pounds. We are hoping that with education that we've given Lani that she will be able to maintain and continue his weight loss. Before he went to boot camp, he weighed 118 pounds. And on Monday after the boot camp, he came back, he weighed only 113 pounds. He lost five pounds in a few days. <laughs> That's a lot of weight, yeah. Dogs, as well as most mammals, have fur to keep them warm. But one dog breed has no hair at all. Do you know what it is? The dog with no hair is the Zolo, a breed that's perfect for people with allergies because they don't cause reactions. The Zolo is from Peru and was nearly extinct until breeders came to the rescue in the 1940s. The hairless Zolo obviously keeps cool by playing in the sprinkler, but keeps warm by having a higher body temperature. From a hairless dog, Let's meet a breed that's the total opposite. It's all about the bearded collie. You may think that there are a lot of different kinds of collies. You'd be right, but the word collie doesn't refer to a specific breed. In Scottish, collie simply refers to any dog that herds. And that's exactly what the bearded collie is known for. As one of Britain's oldest breeds, the bearded collie was first used as a herding dog for Scottish shepherds. One of their playful characteristics is that they are known for jumping up and down, a trait called the beardy bounce. It looks like they're just happy to see you, but the bouncing is a trait that goes back to their herding days. In tall grass, they learn to jump up so they could see their prey. The bearded collie is considered an independent thinker and known as being a great socializer, both with people and with other dogs. They tend to be rambunctious and very energetic and require a good deal of exercise. They also need to be in social situations. If left alone for long periods of time, they can become destructive. But with good training and the proper environment, bearded collies are great family pets. They come in a variety of colors, mostly black, brown, and blue, and they come with or without white markings. Their hair is rather rough, but they have a soft undercoat, and yes, they do shed. 
Because of all that fur, their size is deceiving. They may look big, but adults usually weigh only between 40 and 60 pounds. The average lifespan is about 12 years. If you're looking for a very happy, bouncy dog, look no further than this. And now you know all about the Bearded Collie. There are several breeds of dogs that have long hair that covers their eyes. Is it true that they can see right through it? Can long-haired dogs see through their hair? The answer is kind of. The long hair acts like a pair of sunglasses, allowing the dog to see a little, but keeping out strong light. Some dogs' hair, however, gets so thick that they can't see out at all, and they compensate by using their acute sense of hearing and smell. In that case, their hair should be thin. Completely removing the hair from over its eyes, though, can be harmful because the dog's eyes are not used to such bright light. It's always best to check with a vet. When your furry family member gets sick, the vet is there to help. But what can you do when your vet is closed? Feather and Fur Animal Hospital in Kailua is open for any pet emergency 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I'm Katie Hancock. I'm a veterinarian here at the Feather and Fur Animal Hospital. My position is the general practice uh, doctor during the day, and then I work for the later night shifts and overnights uh, for any emergencies that we may see. So working here overnight is quite a range. Some evenings it'll be pretty slow. Most evenings we have emergencies. In a very extreme case, we have emergencies waiting at the door, emergency C-sections, or large dogs have their stomach twist, need emergency surgery to untwist it. Um, other times it's a little calmer. This is Paya. Uh, it's a small six-week-old uh, Labrador puppy that came in for vomiting um, and also had a little bit of diarrhea uh, while we were in the exam room. As you can see, Paya is a little depressed, a little quiet for a puppy. Um, he's really dehydrated right now, so what we're going to do is put an IV catheter in, keep him in the hospital overnight, and get him on some IV fluids and antibiotics. Uh, and for Paya, it's possible that uh, she may have parvovirus, um, but we suspect probably another type of uh, intestinal virus or bacteria. Um, so we're going to cover for all those things with the antibiotics and the fluids that she'll be on. Despite the yelp, Paya is tougher than she looks. She's a survivor. She's one of only four puppies to survive out of a litter of 14. So we're testing the little puppy's blood on the machine for total counts, and then we've made our blood smear as well, hopefully to give us some insight into what kind of infection and how bad um, this little puppy has. Shh, relax. Yeah, you're fine. Hey, will probably be in the hospital at least 24 hours, um, if not 48, until we can get her eating and drinking well on her own. While doctors wait for Pia's test results, the action continues in this all-hours animal ER as another tiny patient needs help. It started last night, and um, she saw it coming out. It laid down, moved, and that's how she saw the blood, and she kind of looked. So we just got a call about another emergency coming in. Uh, there's a rabbit that has some bloody discharge from around the anus. Uh, the owner's going to be bringing that down shortly. So this is Honey Girl. We don't know how old she is. Is that right? Um, we got her in December. She was uh, right now, we're just doing a general physical exam, feeling her abdomen to make sure she doesn't have any um, signs that her intestines are dilated or have any impaction, um, which can be pretty common for rabbits. I'm feeling a very small area that might have a little bit of uh, ingesta, um, feels a little bit more firm. Maybe kind of part of the problem, but a lot of times if that's the cause, they'll be filled throughout. So I have to put a little alcohol on there for just so we get a better image. I know it's cold, hold on. Doctors use tools similar to those used on humans. In this case, an ultrasound is used on Honey Girl to get samples to help figure out what's wrong. So this looks a little cloudy, but not really the degree of blood that we had on the backside. We'll just check it anyway, make sure there's no signs of infection there. Girl? Honey Girl! Oh, honey girl. We're gonna give honey girl some fluids to hydrate her. We're just gonna do it subcutaneously under her skin. Bunnies have really thin skin, so we're gonna use a butterfly catheter to prevent from tearing their skin. So my original intention for working here 
was to offset the financial woos of being a pet owner. But since I've been here, I find that I may commit to going to vet school. The problem being there's no vet schools on island, so I have to move. But I love Feather and Fur, so I'm staying at this moment. This is a pretty bunny. Oh, he's got like the quintessential fluffy tail. So we got the results of the urine on the bunny. Uh, it doesn't look like there's a urinary tract infection. So right now we're gonna try some antibiotics to target the intestinal tract since the rabbit's still eating and drinking well at home uh, and see if that helps us improve. Certainly if any of the other parameters change or the owner notices a change in clinical signs at home, uh, we'll have them come back and just kind of assess the bunny again and see if there's any other changes. The overnight drama continues at Feather and Fur's emergency room. Soon we'll find out about Paya and what his prognosis is. But first, Dr. Hancock has to give her attention to a patient with possible kidney failure. So Clay is a eight-year-old intact male. Uh, they found out today that his prostate's really big, so that's obstructing his normal outflow of urine. And we're gonna be putting a urinary catheter in to help diurese his kidneys out. The main differentials for him is just a benign uh, enlargement of the prostate, which we can fix with neutering. The prostate will return to a normal size. One of the first causes we think about in an older dog is just kidney failure, um, which will usually start to get better once you put them on IV fluids and try to flush out the kidneys. Uh, in this dog, he was not getting better with that therapy. Uh, and when we did an ultrasound, we were able to find that his prostate was very enlarged. The worst case scenario for Kaleo would be if his kidney values don't improve. Um, and then we'll have to talk with the owners and make a decision whether um, there's anything more aggressive that we can pursue or if it would be time to uh, consider putting Kaleo to sleep. It's a tough choice for Kaleo's owners. Non-neutered dogs have a higher risk of prostate infections and other complications involving the prostate. It's something Dr. Hancock says dog owners should consider when deciding whether to neuter their dog. It's not always a disease or illness that has animals visiting feather and fur in the middle of the night. Sometimes animals are hurt and are in need of immediate help. Uh, so our next appointment is for a um, middle-aged dog that got into a dog fight earlier today. It has a pretty open wound, so we're gonna check that out and see if it just needs some antibiotics and time to heal or if we need to do a closure on the wound. So it looks like, for now, we're pretty lucky. There's a lot of vital structures in this area, a lot of uh, blood vessels and obviously the trachea as well. Um, but it looks like it's just below the skin there. I think we, I think we got lucky. So, but I'll be able to tell more once we're doing the procedure because I'll be able to poke around in there a lot more. And make sure. With dog bite wounds, was they have curved teeth and they basically will try to grab and shake. Um, they cause a lot of shearing that's underneath the skin. So even though we have two wounds right here, um, we can see that as far as my hemostats go in, the wound extends pretty far up on both sides. We get a lot of uh, what we call pocketing underneath the superficial wounds. When it comes to dog bites, doctors must treat what they can see and what they can't see, like infections. Even if a bite doesn't look infected, doctors take every precaution to clean the wound and prescribe antibiotics to keep any infection from happening. So Maka did really well with anesthesia and we were able to close up the bite wounds. Um, I did have to place a drain here that's gonna help close all that dead space, help drain out any residual infection uh, and help the wound basically to heal down normally. Less than an hour after the operation started, Maka is back up and alert. A drain has been placed in her wound to help it clear of any infection. If all goes well, Maka should be as good as new in about a week. It should heal just fine. Well, it's about 1 a.m. Um, looks like we're finishing up for the night. Um, everything went overall pretty smoothly, but we'll see what tomorrow has to offer. But before we go, let's check back in with Paya. The test results are in, and good news, she does not have parvo, which can be deadly, especially to young pups like her. It's just a simple stomach virus, and looking at the wagging of her tail, she's already starting to feel better.